Yeah. Trickling in and then we'll get started, okay? Are you? Well, I'm going to be sharing. Because when you're talking, people want to see this. Okay. Sharing the screen. It's okay. You'll just be able to ask very much what. Just don't unmute yourself, yourself or it's going to be like a yes. weird. Yeah. That was my thing in the book. Okay. okay. So I should turn it on. But first, we did the book. Yeah, you just do the all the work. Don't do the agenda. So you just call the meeting. Right. Is that cross coming? So Doug here. We're also waiting on Sue Hammond, Bruce Morris, Ted Wilgis, and Tim Lowell. Ted said he's running late. He's running late. So we're it's a couple minutes. So it's to you. Give people a minute or so. Yeah, he didn't say how long because at least 15 minutes because he's coming from Brunswick County. Yeah. Five more minutes. Yeah. 607 will take him. Yeah. Or me. She's the <laughs> best. <laughs> The plane is taking off. It's taking our plane off. I'm not laying the fucking off. What I always tell them when they're taking too long in meetings, I'm like, it's time to land the plane. I'm not like that. Usually she comes in and she's like, so you're almost Wrap it up. You guys have the craziest hours. Yeah. <laughs> I can call you any time and you're available and it bothers me. <laughs> Doctor, that call. <laughs> if only for me, I'm in the mud. In the mud. <laughs> <laughs> so we schedule to go. Yeah, I'm going to get money at 5 30 in the morning. Where are you going with? Um, Jet Dodge crew. Dan and Cat. And then I don't know what we're netting for. He, I asked him, and he was like, I don't know what we're netting for either. He'll just. Hey Tim, can you hear me? You're muted. Hi, uh, yes, I can. Perfect. We'll get started at 6 7. We're still waiting on a few minutes. All right, sorry I got late. That's okay. Bad traffic up here. Okay. Sheldon lost his phone at school mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. He got spammed and he didn't have to on mute. Oh, the English teacher took it. We can do the crowd. Thank you. Yeah. Other teachers will just say mute that and put it away. He had it away. It's just got to unmute it. Got to go in. Mine started reading me my text messages about it. I'm gonna go in and find a good call. Like I'll be sitting in there all the sudden and starts talking. Oh, <laughs> oh can you get the echo or the dot or whatever? You know. 
Okay, uh, Although there was one thing in the place of my story, I think it's where they say the and then branched over here and then it also yeah well yeah it's been a huge we're like yeah we talk like like i read it i'm like what's this all right it is 607 i'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order um on a shallows here and um can we get an approval of the agenda um, everyone present a motion to approve to approve i I'll second, second. all right all in favor say aye 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 I think okay. I think that works with the virtuality. All right. Um, uh, did anybody have any comments on the minutes that were given out? If there's something that they'd like to put the table before we begin, thought they were very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, hand it over to Laura for the Marine Fisheries Commission update. Okay. Before you do that, just do a motion. I'm sorry. Let's do a motion to approve the minutes. And to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, now we're gonna get into the minutes of what? All right. So um, so I am going to give you an update on the Fisheries Commission February business meeting. Help. We give you a brief overview um, of highlights from that meeting, but I also want to remind you that those meetings um, are recorded, as are these meetings. So if you are interested in going back and looking at any specific topic or hearing the discussion, um, you can go back and listen to the whole meeting or any part of that meeting. I do want to warn you. Start listening to things on YouTube, it's going to impact your algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can start getting DEQ meetings all over the place. All right, so um, first off, we have false albacore. So in February, the commission reviewed a false albacore information paper that the division had prepared at their request. Um, this was an update to a 2017 paper that was a general review of information about the false albacore fishery in North Carolina. Um, following quite a bit of discussion on the information paper, um, the commission did ultimately pass a motion asking staff to develop rulemaking language with management options for false albacore, starting with the status quo 
and allowing for growth in the fishery at various percentage points. So um, staff are now reviewing the available data um, to define some of those terms that were included in that motion, um, such as status quo, what does that mean at this time? And also the division um, is gonna be presenting its initial analysis at the commission's May meeting. So um, we're gonna be talking about what those, um, the status quo and then also what those percent percentage points are or what they uh, are anticipating those to look like. Um, and then the final issue paper with the rule uh, language options is anticipated for either the August or the November commission meeting. Um, let's see, for spotted sea trout, in February, the staff leads presented an overview of the spotted sea trout fishery and received input from commissioners on items for consideration in the FMP development. So just as a reminder, um, we just completed the scoping period for spotted sea trout. Uh, so we are at the very beginning of FMP development. So no draft plan has been written. We have just received public input for the spotted sea trout plan. So that's where we are in that process. So staff are now going to take the feedback that they received during the scoping process. Um, and also um, any feedback from the commission as well as um, the ACs today if you have any feedback and, and from the other um, ACs that occurred last week and we'll begin to develop that draft. So like I said, you have the opportunity tonight to provide feedback um, if there are management strategies that you'd like staff to consider um, as they begin to draft that plan. Um, I do want to acknowledge the feedback provided by Commissioner Cross. Um, who hopefully will join us in a bit, um, which was uh, more comprehensive than we generally have at this point. Um, however, uh, we have received very clear public comment on that um, on that statement. So it actually, I would say, you know, it got us started on the conversation uh, pretty quickly. So ultimately, a good thing. <laughs> um, and uh, I do want to say that. You know, public input is a huge part of fishery management here in North Carolina. And so any conversation and the soonest um, that we can have it, you know, is, is better. All right. Okay. It's his anniversary. He's not getting on. <laughs> yeah. These are things you should tell us. All right. Strike on. Sorry. No. Um, now, so strike mullet. So back in November of last year, the commission selected their preferred management options for the strike mullet supplement A. And that was for the statewide on November 7th through December 31st season, season closure, which was estimated to result in a 22.1% reduction. So in February, the commission heard the outcome of the public comment period um, of that. Uh, of their selected option. And based on that comment, they did um, request that the division consider developing regionally specific seasons for the, for the strike mullet fishery. Um, so staff are currently working on that. Um, and that will be uh, coming to the commission at their May meeting for further discussion. So just as a reminder, again, a supplement is a, a meant to overdraft. A supplement is meant to address overfishing. Um, immediately while more comprehensive management is developed in an event. So in May, the commission um, will be uh, selecting perhaps from the original options or from the additional options that the staff can provide. All right, and finally, uh, I am gonna wrap up with an item from the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. So relating to the CHIP, the commission unanimously approved a motion supporting the coastal habitat initiative resolution, which came from the stakeholder engagement and coastal habitats initiative. Um, and this resolution was focused on encouraging the state to increase funding for voluntary cost share programs to help improve water quality. So as a reminder, DMF and AppNet work collaboratively with a core team of NGOs to uh, form a public private partnership which is the um, Stakeholder Engagement and Coastal Habitats Initiative, also known as SEPI, um, which is a recommendation from the 2021 CHIP Amendment. Um, and that resolution um, was also supported by the Coastal Resources Commission and the 
um, Environmental Management uh, Commission in their recent meetings, which were after the Marine Fisheries Commission February meeting. <clears throat> All right, so the May Commission meeting is scheduled for May 24th um, through the 26th at the Beaufort Hotel in Beaufort. Um, and I've talked about striped mullet, spotted sea trout, and false albacore, which are all on the May agenda. But if you uh, want to see a more complete overview of what is expected on that agenda, um, I do encourage you to go back and look at the MFC work plan, which is put out with the briefing materials for each meeting. So the most current one is from the February meeting, but it gives you an overview of the next three or four years. I can't remember what the time scale is, but basically what's coming up at each meeting in the, in the big scale of things. All right. Okay, so that's my break. Um, Chair, if possible, I have a second item on the agenda. Okay. It's the July joint meeting planning. Okay. Um, yep, I if that. you don't mind, and if the committee doesn't mind, can I, I, can, I can do that. Okay. And also, if there's any questions about the commission updates. All right. Okay. So, going into the July AC workshop, um, we have decided on a Monday, July 10th as the um, date for that. And it will be held during the day. It's going to be um, tentatively scheduled for 10 to 3 on July 10th. Um, so if you'll recall, we sent out a survey to try to figure out what was the best day for everybody. And for 50% of um, the respondents said that day was the day that they could do. So that is our day. Um, the meeting will take place at the North Carolina Aquarium at Pine Hill Shores. Um, we recognize that this will require a bit of travel for many of you, and so one of the reasons um, that we chose the aquarium is because we will be able to use the space at a reduced cost, um, which should allow us to provide uh, more funds for travel and hotels. Uh, so the aquarium is a beautiful venue, which we feel will also help with the tone of the meeting. Um, so if you have any questions about that, please feel free. Um, to reach out to myself or to Paula Barnell, um, we can talk more about it. Um, the overall goal of this workshop is to bring members of all five ACs together uh, to, for open discussion and to hear the DMS staff and others talk about key topics of interest. Um, for example, we've had a number of requests from different advisors for overviews of things like stock assessments, FMP process, um, things that are sort of a broader nature. Um, so we hope it will be an opportunity for networking, um, discussion, and collaboration between all the ACs. So we are still in planning stages, but we will continue to update all of the committees. Um, you will likely get another email with more information requested, so please keep an eye out for those. Um, and otherwise, um, we'll keep everyone updated as we get a draft agenda um, done and as we continue planning. So, and that concludes my update. Thank you, Laura. Awesome. Um, let's move on to the shellfish, I'm sorry, shellfish lease program. Um, the general overview with uh, Owen. All right, thank you. Um, this may sound fairly familiar um, for those of you that were at the last uh, commission business meeting. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address those at the end. Um, so tonight I'm going to be providing an update on the shellfish lease and obstacle program and going over some of the changes that staff have implemented in an effort to improve program efficiency. So in 2022, we received 84 shellfish lease applications. 11 bottom leases, the ocean waterfall leases were presented for public hearing uh, in Carteret County on February 15th. And we also held public hearings in Onslow County on February 28th, Hamilton County on March 2nd, Pender County on March 15th, Hyde County on March 29th, and Dare County on April 12th. We have a public hearing in Carter County um, next month, and that will um, round out all of the 2021 and 2022 shellfish lease application public hearings. Um, just in time for the 2023 um, application season open. Um, the application period opened March 1st and will close August 1st. So far, we've received five applications, um, but we do expect this to be another um, busy year. Now I'll speak briefly about the program efficiencies that the shellfish lease program and 
permits program have been incorporating to address the increased demand for leases and permits and to improve customer experience. First, the Shellfish Lease Program has consolidated their annual rent notices, production reports, and work authorizations into a single mailing, which is sent to all leaseholders in January. We include a one-pager summarizing newly adopted rules as well with the mail-out this year so that leaseholders are aware of any impacts that these rule changes may have on their operations. Shellfish Lease Renewal Packages, which are sent out at the end of the 10-year Shellfish Lease Contract, will now include copies of the original Shellfish Lease Application and Management Plan for reference to aid in leaseholders filling out the renewal application. On a similar note, we have developed template forms to assist leaseholders with and expedite the shellfish lease transfer process, which is becoming increasingly popular over the past few years. We're also increasing the availability of lease siting, storm preparedness, gear and marine debris management, and technical guidance resources for applicants and leaseholders, developing new resource guides and making our existing resources more available on the website. Moving on to aquaculture permits, the aquaculture operations permit renewal packet has been streamlined with a one page renewal form, fillable PDFs and digital filing. This has facilitated a 10 day turnaround time for AOPs, as well as a 48 to 72 hour turnaround for intro and aquaculture seed transplant permits. Lastly, the development of the AOP inspection tool will facilitate expedited inspections and ensure consistency throughout the entire annual inspection process. And I'll take any questions. Where are most of your applications are coming from? What's the region right now? Um, well, so I'll speak to last year just because yeah, yeah, morning, yeah, yeah, because we can kind of look at the whole seasons. Um, so the, the majority of those applications um, came from either Carteret County or Pender Hollow. Um, there, I mean, those, those areas where we see most of our existing leases, and that's also where there's most of the interest for new leases as well. How many leases are we able to take on? In terms of like water body capacity or yeah. capacity, water body, um, I don't have a number for that. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, there was a presentation um, at the Baker Cave Commission a year or two ago about um, looking at that, essentially determining a carry capacity, then fitting the number of leases for different water bodies, um, and. In conjunction with the, the new rules that went through uh, with the 250 foot buffer between leases, increasing riparian distances, or riparian setbacks from developed shorelines, and the cumulative impact language. Um, a lot of those rules addressed um, some of the issues that developing a carrying capacity and limiting leases would also address, um, mm -hmm. kind of focusing on some of those high use areas where we have a lot of leases, see more. Um, so at, at the time, our recommendation was not to move forward with pursuing um, developing, you know, that kind of threshold. And again, it depends on the water bodies. Um, shellfish leases have to be compatible with public trust use. So depending on public trust use, water body size and shape and a lot of different factors can impact the number of leases that are going to be compatible in those different areas. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, I believe that uh, Zach Harrison is going to talk to us about uh, the relay program update. Thank you. My name is Zach Harrison. I'm the aquaculture permits coordinator. Today I'll be updating you on the polluted area relay program. February commission meeting of last year, Jacob Boy gave a verbal update on the relay program phase out. Today, I'll give you a quick look at the relay program over the last few years and report on the 2021 and 2022 relay seasons. For review, the relay program allows the shellfish and franchise holders to harvest shellfish in designated polluted areas and transport them to the lease or franchise. This is a permitted activity that only occurs between April 1st and May 15th program was originally enacted due to major loss among lease and franchise holders due to harmful algal blooms. One major factor in the phase out of the relay program was the production requirement changes for shellfish leases and franchises enacted in the 2019 aquaculture bill. These changes excluded relayed shellfish from being counted in the annual production reports, 
removing the ability of lease and franchise holders from meeting production through utilizing the relay program. Another factor is the National Shellfish Sanitation Program's requirement for all shellfish moved from polluted areas to be monitored by Marine Patrol. Officers must oversee the harvest, transport, and placement of relayed shellfish. And as you all have been briefed previously, filling open Marine Patrol positions has been a challenge, as well as the need for more officers to cover increasing demands. Lastly, over the last 10 years, there's been a continuous decrease in the participation of this program. As a result of these last two factors, in 2019, the relay season was limited to two days per week in two areas. Jacob Boyd announced last year that the, the division has begun the process of phasing out the relay program in three final seasons. The end date for relay is set for May 1st, 2024, following the season next year. The 2021 relay season included three locations in Carteret County and three locations in Southern Onslow Bay counties, New Hanover, Pender, and Onslow. In preparation for the 2022 relay season, the 2021 participants were contacted to provide input on the previous year's locations and if they would prefer others. Based on this input, the 2022 relay season locations were changed to incorporate three additional southern locations that were rotated through. Once the season was planned, the relay application was sent to all bottom lease and franchise holders. 2022 followed the same season schedule as the 2019 through 2021 seasons with two days per week for six weeks. In 2021, one day a week included one Carteret County location and two Southern Onslow Bay locations, and the next day included one Carteret County location and one Southern Onslow Bay location. The 2022 season followed the same process with the additional sites rotated through. As a reminder, a limiting factor with relay dates and number of locations is Marine Patrol officers as each site requires at least three officers to enable relaying that day. By March of 20, by March 18th of 2022, received 33 applications from the relay package mail outs. These applications met the deadline for full participation in the season. There were four more applications that were received by the final deadline for participation in the last four weeks of the season. This accounts for the total of 37 permits and 34 applicants included here in the yearly permit and participant data. This season remains on the lower end of relay participation for the last 20 years, and nearly half of the average permits over this time. Lastly, you can see the change to two relay days per week starting in 2019. Next, I have a more in-depth look at the relay participation for 2021 and 2022. First, you can see the permits remain similar with 32 in 2021 and 37 in 2022. Next, the number of unique applicants remain nearly the same. The difference in permits versus applicants numbers of 2021 is primarily due to the lease work authorization forms allowing for authorized workers to obtain their own permits instead of in the leaseholder's name. The total number of leases and franchises involved in each season remain the same. And next is the number of permitted transplanters. To clarify, each relay application can include up to six designees and three vessels, each of which can sign in individually and relay to the permitted lease. This allows for extra help for the season along with enabling subleases to participate in the season. As you can see from the 32 and 37 permits, we get around 70 unique transplanters total. The total number of unique participants that showed up and relayed at any site at least once, however, was less than a third of those with only 17 and 22 for 2021 and 2022 respectively. Furthermore, the daily average participation across all locations per day was only five and eight transplanters. Remember, one day a week includes three locations at once. And lastly, the daily average participation by location is only three and four, four transplanters. A concern that was voiced by the commission in the February 2022 meeting was by phasing out the relay program, would we be ridding leases and franchises of one of the main methods by which bottom leases are able to produce shellfish without the prospect of water column amendments for floating gear? In response, I've included a comparison of lease types to those participating in the relay program. First, we have the total numbers of bottom leases and franchises for the last four years, which have been steadily increasing. Next, the number of water columns, which are also increasing, along with the total numbers for uh, bottom leases, franchises, and water columns combined, which is increasing. As you're aware, a water column cannot be obtained without the underlying bottom lease. So to determine the number of leases or franchises without a water column attached, the water columns 
are subtracted from the bottom slash franchise number and leaves the total remaining bottom only leases and franchises. This number is remaining steady or possibly slightly increasing despite the option to apply for water amendments for either. Lastly, we see the total number of leases and franchises involved in the relay seasons for these years. This group is both decreasing and less than a third to a quarter of leases that cannot use any floating here. One caveat that I didn't mention is that leases or franchises with a water column can still participate in the relay season if they choose to. Given this information, the vast majority of bottom only leases and franchises are meeting production without utilizing the relay program. I'll be giving an update uh, on the 2023 season at the February commission meeting next year. With that will take any questions. Um, are the transporters of these oysters given like instructions for what they should be moving? Are they moving clusters? Are they moving singles? Are they moving? So in the application process, they have to highlight if they're going for oysters claims or both. Okay. And we, uh, in the reporting, they have to report bushels of oysters, bushels of clams, or bushels of sh uh, shell, because polluted shell stock in um, the National Shellfish Sanitation Program or plan is also considered movement of polluted shellfish stock. Mm -hmm. So they have to denote that in the uh, in the report, but there's no restrictions, at least, as to if you can harvest what size or if they have to be all over a certain size or is it so they're not going off the three inch marker or anything like that it's just anything they want to transport they can transport yes okay and it's by it's calculated or it's documented by the weight or by the bushel not by the number of oysters so they report yes by the bushel and then okay basically bring it back to their lease and when they harvest later it would follow the same harvest requirements of trip tickets and be okay. reported that way so the back end recording now granted in, in the relay program, they usually get somewhere between 50 and 70% recovered from their lease, depending on what's already on their lease. Okay. Um, but yes. Uh, do you have any uh, relay action down in B7 or B6 at all? Um, so the furthest south this year was Old Topsail Creek. Um, previously, the furthest south was Futch Creek. Um, but because of, again, this year, it's, we had to slightly changed a bit because rain control was even that much more stressed and this heavily lands on them mm -hmm. and so we ended up having to move fudge creek or not include fudge creek in there okay. um, so the applicants for new hanover county there's usually one to two um, but from what i'm from from what they reported they either didn't relay the previous year or when they did they still made it up to old topsail creek okay so they were still able to move up there gotcha. we, thank you we opened Butch Creek, we only had one person. I think I see them. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> I think I see that one person. And, yeah. And that's not enough people for us to spend all day. Agreed. Right. Okay. When they can go just a little bit farther. And we make record or we make any means possible if they've got to put their vehicle on a or put their boat onto their trailer and then trailer back down south. Mm -hmm. We we follow them any way we have to. But nice to it just it's too much to to spread all all out today. understood yeah everybody short gotcha thank you have we considered adding additional leases for availability given the quality that it helps the water and also it you know i, I know several folks who have leases and it seems to be very positive from especially the the water quality and all that around that area. Have we ever considered that or is it a resource limitation issue? Adding leases from our end? Like yes. Us adding? yes. So the lease process, as Owen can tell you even further, is it has to be applicant defined. So what the, on our side, what we are doing is trying to do as much outreach as we can on those ecosystem services and education on municipalities so they understand that leases provide a lot of good things. But we we basically evaluate applications for leases. We can't really make any decisions there. Is there any way? So, to, is there any way to communicate that out? Because you know I've talked with. When I was down there in February 
with a couple of local folks that go oystering, you know, for commercial type stuff. And they don't have leases and ask them, why don't you have a lease? And he said, well, I don't think I can get it. There's kind of a, you know, cause these are not college educated folks from it. Is there any way we could get the commercial guys to help with this or something? Cause it's very positive with having these from everything I've seen and heard. Hey, Tim, this is Owen with the lease program. Um, I, I absolutely agree. I think that the shellfish leases do provide um, some really, really great environmental uh, benefits. In terms of the new leases, we essentially have our hands full with as many lease applications as we can handle every year. Um, so the, the industry and the lease program is growing. Um, I, I'm not, um, we really haven't done any targeted outreach of trying to recruit new applicants um, necessarily um, to, to apl apply for the program because it is so well utilized already. Um, but it is interesting that you bring up that there are, you know, some folks that, that don't think that they're, that they'd be able to obtain a lease. Uh, and I would, I would encourage, um, encourage them to, to reach out to me or um, I'm happy to give you my contact information as well to pass along because we can help with that process. People that, uh, want to get a lease if they call, you know, or walk in or send me an email. We walk them through the whole process, what we need from them, um, and they provide a lot of support with that. Because I just, I just think it would be beneficial for them and beneficial for the waterways. And it's just I've heard that several times, and it just, you know, I think. All right, let me talk to some of the folks down there. I know one guy who has an who has a lease. And I've never really discussed it with him. Let me do that, and then I'll I may get back to you. Right, because this just makes so much sense. Anna Shellen here. Can I make a comment? Um, I've when I first got, I guess I can. I'm leaving it. Please, <laughs> Louise. <laughs> Um, I have, uh, when I first got started, I heard about how hard it was to obtain a lease and I was like, cool, no problem. I'll just harvest wild. And that's what I've stuck with. And I've done nothing but wild harvest because mother nature gives us enough to enjoy. And, um, I have not, I've been doing it for seven years and I have not looked for a lease because we have abundance where we need it. And um, I would hate to be closed off to one specific area. I'm not interested in farming. I'm not interested in employees. I just want to use what our nature, our natural resource is giving us. And so um, I would I would be kind of discouraged if leases were a, a, a and uh, like a, you have to have one. I would, I would, it would turn me off. I like being able to go explore those areas. Sorry to frustrate you if I am. No, uh, look, I'm not. I'm not saying that they would should require. I just think there's an opportunity where people okay. could go, out, especially in areas when there's polluted area where you can transfer them, let them clean up, and all that. It just helps. The whole gotcha. environment helps the oystermen. I'm not saying it's a requirement. I think there's opportunity, and you could even do this in areas where other oyster leases are, so it reduces the travel time and the resource commission from the folks at the com at the wildlife commission having to do. So if you I got gotcha. an oyster lease at a half a mile from each other, which I think could be done easily. It's very easy for them to have work in this one. I can work that one at the same time. I gotcha. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Question, uh, Ted Logas. With the um, relay that in 21 and 22, and if you can see anything in the 23 yet, what are the regional differences in terms of District 1 and District 2? So uh, there hasn't been any ever in any primarily because there's not many leases up there. Um, so there's now kind of developing some of the um, over token. That's district one? That's district oh, Sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I kind of flipped. Sorry. District, yes. 
so in district one in district three it's um it's those three counties so onsville Kenford, and hanover um and there seems to be the same group for the past 10 or so years on uh, leases and leaseholders that have kind of continued the relay program as the remainder of them have dwindled but there's I think because that is spanning three counties, District Three have a few more people, um, but there's a, a similarly solid group in both Carter County as well as further south in those Onslow Bay counties. Um, if I can ask a follow up, just um, you know, you said that it came about primarily due to the the red tide '88. If we had another similar situation with a red tide or some kind of outbreak um, and there was a fairly large demand and need to do a kind of relay program what would um, what would it take to actually get it back up again and what role would either this committee or other committees have involved in not being a will but just just in case well and and hopefully um, I obviously I can't see what's going to happen but Hopefully the, the style of farming and, and one thing we've seen this past year is uh, a lot of mortality events, which are currently being researched by um, some people at NC State and UNCW. Um, but there, there's the, the movement of leases is becoming a kind of diversified and somewhat assured process that it's becoming closer to farming in the sense of you have some safety nets, whereas back then that when those like halves happened, it was basically you lost everything. It wasn't easy to do. And inherently, because it is covered by the NSSP, there is some risk there, but the idea is that they will be flushed out. Um, but it's I think the biggest hurdle to bringing it back is that you wouldn't be able to include that as your uh, meeting production for them. So where planting would count, and if you purchased seed and planted it and then it was killed off by an algal bloom, you could still meet production through your planting uh, because relay isn't counting as planting and you'd have to harvest that amount, which could be done, but it is a, a it's not an easy beat. Um, compared to the method of, of leases and actually kind of planting seed and harvesting that to meet production. Um, so I think that's the difficulty is especially the offshore for Bill. I just, um, I work primarily in that district three region. And um, one of the things we're struggling with is trying to determine the areas that are closed or polluted, um, whether or not the oysters in there are healthy and Oftentimes referred to as sanctuary, de facto sanctuaries, and that affects potentially the management of the entire resource of the region. And so, if we're re relaying out of those areas, then they are they are not acting as sanctuaries. And so, if the relay, if some sort of relay does come back, it'd be nice to see some um, ability to monitor what creek is is producing how much. Um, stock being relayed out of it. What is the health of that of the stock in that creek pre and post relay? The mortality is you know, 70, uh, 30 to 50 percent. So you're losing a lot of stock during that relay. So I see it as, as something that, you know, like after Hurricane Florence, there were hundreds of leases that were just wiped out. They had lost all their stock. Um, a lot, a lot, in a lot of areas, wild, lot, wild stock was lost too. But that an event like that might be a push to the, for people to say, I don't have anything, kind of get some wild stock and bring it in. So I guess I'm just saying, the worst case scenario, if we do have to look at this again, can we adapt it to look at our current issues and knowledge since this program has changed greatly? Yeah, what, what, what could be the mechanism for doing away with it? Are you going to send the, the permit you're going to change the rules or just an administrative decision how, how is that stopping the relay going to happen so rule changes are being implemented uh, to remove relay polluted area relay from the rules 
Um, and to get to your point this, uh, as well, the, there is also a different relay program that is the seed oyster management area relay. And so as of right now, there's uh, currently four, four or five permits. And most of those coincide with polluted, polluted area relay participants because one, so there's one soma in one of the polluted areas in Virginia Creek. So to to relay out of that particular portion of Virginia Creek in the whole area allowed out of that, you have to have that permit. But that is another relay permit that would be an option that people could move to that's very underutilized, um, but it's not going away because it's not it has the, it doesn't have to be required by marine or, or watched over by marine patrol because they're in management areas and not in polluted areas. So this is specifically relaying out of polluted areas. Virginia Creek would still be. What would happen with Virginia Creek? So, this so half of the soma is included and half of the soma is below. So there is still soma spot able to be open. And that, that goes from um, April 1st through October either 15th or 31st. So you have the entire season to relay on your own time as opposed to the, the season that has to be in place and rate control and oversee. Thank you very much. This talking about the red tide relay. There were a few places where that worked fairly well. Fall Creek down south, and by and large, that was a great waste of oyster resource and habitat. People got involved in, the, in that, didn't actually harvest shellfish. They were bringing bushels of shells, taking skiffs and loading them down and piling it all up on the mud if somebody wasn't right there watching them. That was it was not a good experience. So um and it, and it was done not for oyster resources. I mean the first thought was to keep the fishermen employed. And they say, Well, what can we do? Well, the whole state's shut down, so there's a relay of oysters. It didn't it didn't turn out very well except in a couple of locations. It's not when it started, was it though? So Relay. No, I no. thought it started prior to that. Oh, yeah, it's been done for, for a long time. It's been done two leases, and the state has actually done relaying itself. Uh, we had a, a seed oyster har uh, seed oyster harvester, but it was also used in polluted areas. The state actually took the oysters out. So having more leases would be a good thing since we could relay North Carolina oysters. I know a lot of farmers that bring in a lot of seed from Florida and Virginia and all that. And if we can keep it in the state, that's awesome. All right. Um, spotted sea trout scoping discussion with Lucas. Nope. No, it's actually going to be Jason. Hey, Jason. <laughs> So Lucas and Jason are the staff leads for Spotted Sea Trout. So they've been sort of going back and forth for these meetings and taking turns. Thanks, Jason. Thank you all for having me. I know you deal with shellfish, so you may not be too interested in sea trout, but uh, just in case, uh, I do appreciate the chance to be here and talk to you guys and uh, talk about some of the comments we heard during scoping, uh, as well as to hear any comments you guys have for us tonight. Uh, like I said, I'm Jason Rock. I'm a biologist supervisor out of the Moorhead City office here, and I'm one of the co-leads for the Spotted Sea Trout Fishery Management Plan. Uh, Lucas Pensinger, who's not here tonight, he's the other co-lead for the management plan. Uh, so the scoping period for Amendment 1 uh, took place from March 13th to March 24th, and we actually had a lot of participation. We had over 700 participants uh, that either showed up to a meeting in person or submitted comments through our online questionnaire. Uh, and for most of the topics uh, that were brought up, comments varied uh, with individuals being for and against uh, specific management strategies and pretty much everything in between. Uh, so I'll give a brief overview of the comments as they relate to each of the potential management strategies we're looking at. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions and hear your input. Uh, on the management strategies as well. Uh, so starting with sustainable harvest, uh, 
it was pretty unanimous that people were against the quota for the climate sea trout fishery. Uh, I don't I don't know if there were really many people for a quota, uh, but definitely a lot of people against a quota. Uh, I think there were a lot of assumptions too that we all already had a quota, which isn't the case. Uh, and a lot of the comments we received are just how people were talking about it. Uh, seasonal closures came up. Uh, there was some support for seasonal closures either in the winter time or during the spawning season in the summer. Uh, and then a lot of people against seasonal closures as well. So <laughs> kind of a mixed bag there. Uh, some people were okay with bag limit reductions. Others didn't want to see a bag limit reduction. Uh, same for trip limits on the commercial fishery. Uh, and we did hear a lot for uh, increasing the minimum size limit as well, and also a lot for keeping it where it is. Um, so, like I said, we heard support for and against a lot of this thing. As far as recreational management, uh, we did hear some things that were spotted sea trout specific. Uh, we did hear there was a large uh, response uh, from people wanting sea trout to be a game fish or a recreational only fishery. Uh, also heard a lot that we need to do more outreach as far as catch and release best practices uh, in the recreational fishery, uh, especially since sea trout, there does seem to be a larger contingent of just catch and release fishermen, uh, guys who aren't even looking to harvest. Uh, there were a lot of folks that were against ruckle harvest. Uh, which is using commercial gear recreationally uh, to harvest spotted sea trout. Uh, we did hear some support for boat limits uh, in the recreational fishery, as well as eliminating the captain and crew limit on guided trips. Um, we also did hear some calls for, for limited entry in the fishery as well. And then just generally, uh, there was some interest in trying to reduce tournament impacts on spotted sea trout, uh, as well as gear requirements. And the gear requirements are things like uh, circle hooks only for live bait, you know, or single inline hooks on uh, like hard baits or soft plastics, that sort of thing. Uh, not using treble hooks. Um, heard some support for it. We heard some people who are against it uh, as well. And, it's in the general group because it's one of those things that would be hard to implement for sea trout specifically because you use a lot of the same baits for red for striped bass for other other uh, species as well so something like that might have to be done more across the board than just the sea trout specifically uh, as far as commercial management uh we did get some here's some support for uh hook and line commercial fishery uh, and that was often paired with uh, limited entry in the fishery as well to keep new people from jumping in. Uh, so some of the examples were just allowing guys who've had harvest the past three or four years to participate in the fishery. Then uh, generally with uh, commercial management, uh, heard support for reducing gill net effort, uh, reducing all commercial effort, uh, closing the personal consumption loophole, uh, commercial subsidies to phase out, phase out built nets, uh, area limits or area closures, uh, increasing the uh, for gill nets, uh, increasing gill net mesh size, and then required gill net dependence. And as far as uh, protecting spawning stock biomass, uh, there was some support for and against the slot limit in the fishery, uh, essentially. Uh, reducing bag limits uh, after a cold sun closure. Uh, there was some support for that. Increasing the minimum size limit after a cold stun as well. And then just uh, longer cold stun closures as well uh, for years when we do have a cold stun. Then for area management, uh, there were some calls to manage uh, gill nets on an area basis. A lot of this had to do with uh, Restricting or keeping gill nets out of some of the smaller creeks and smaller water bodies, uh, particularly in the southern part of the state. Uh, closing uh, specific areas to all spotted sea trout fishing, so it would be recreational and commercial. Uh, and then regional or localized management. We really heard this from the guys uh, in the southern part of the state. Uh, it was really where we heard that just because of the, the different water bodies compared to the northern part of the state. 
Uh, and since Commissioner Cross did provide uh, some thoughts as well ahead of scoping, we did get some feedback at the scoping meet meetings uh, on his proposal. Uh, overwhelmingly, comments were against it and felt it was unnecessary. Uh, like I said before, there was no support for a quota in the, the sea trout fishery, and there was definitely no support for ending catch and release fishing. Uh, you know, if there were to be a quota as well. So, and then just some other general ideas that came up. Uh, there were some interest in ecosystem or multi species management, both from a biological perspective and from a regulatory perspective, um, as well as stocking fish, uh, increasing enforcement efforts, uh, you know, looking at management in other states and seeing what works there. Uh, as well as recreationally reporting your catch through an app. Uh, and there was some support for that to be either voluntary or mandatory. Um, that. So, so that's just a brief rundown. It didn't probably didn't sound brief, but we got a lot of ideas and a lot of feedbacks. <laughs> so if you guys have any questions or want to provide comments, uh, happy to hear them. I have one question. How does the um, coastal habitat protection plan, I'm looking at their habitat for feeding habitat areas, play into the to the review for the trout? Um, well, I guess the trout strategic yeah, strategic habitat area specifically, they haven't actually been through that whole process yet, and and could fill you in more. No, there's no rules in place like. We've done the GIS assessment, right? And we have areas identified, but they're not in our rule book. However, we did like two years of sampling in the in the lower half of the state, basically from Core Sound down through Brunswick. And I'm supposed to be working on the report, writing up that the results get started. But um it'll be done soon. But I mean, we did see Definitely, there was um, a trend of greater diversity in the areas designated as Shaws compared to non Shaws, which makes sense because the Shaws are mostly around structure habitats. That was sort of the, it was a habitat assessment, you know, that drove the selection. So, I mean, it looks kind of positive that Shaws um, were good or better, but in some cases, the non Shaws also, like on the Cape Fear River, that was a little bit different than other places. So trying to figure it out. So right now it's not really used for management, but they have used the layers and looked at it informally. Okay. Yeah, just to add, sorry, I'm on that habitat portion of the sea trout PDT. So part of what we did is writing that doing a literature review of habitats known to be used by sea trout that we can reference the chip and not necessarily directly apply, but we have everything that we've collated in literature that kind of corresponds to that as well. Thank you. Make a comment. I'm glad that we're focusing on the southern part of our state because <clears throat> with our the mullet discussions in the past meeting, I think we forgot about our our fishermen down there and um it's nice that we're giving them a stronger look. Um, anybody else have any other questions for Jason? All set? All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, July joint meeting planning. You already did that. All right, let's do some public comment. First, we have Kelly Schoolcraft. Wherever you want. Come on up. It's up to you. Appreciate your chance to talk to you guys, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kelly Schoolcraft. My son and I, we were on a charter boat business out of Hatters. Um, it's an upstart. Well, I say upstart. We've been doing it for four years. Country Time Coastal. Um, our mainstay charter is a two hour clamming trip. Secondly, was in with shelling, and then we do combination trips. Probably the least that I do is fishing trips because there's a lot of fishing charters out there. 
since we've been doing this years, every year we have seen an increase of the base scallops and we can't keep them. And I tell my charters, we can't keep them. The marine fishers won't let us do it. Why? I don't know. Bad science, there's stuff that's on, focuses on fisheries. You know, we're getting short in the stick. Well, uh, what is it? Carteret County, I guess, has a three month season. Why are we being discriminated against? Hyde County and Bear County is inundated with bay scallops on the back side of their islands. Uh, it would, to me, would help myself and my charters. We're allowed 200 clams per day, well, per trip limit. They got to be one inch. It would certainly help the clam stocks if we could uh, keep like a combination of scallops and clams to the 200. Might go out and get 70 or 80 scallops or keep 120, 130 clams. It just makes sense. Uh, but that's basically my question is how come we're not allowed scallop season, in particular, like this time of year. Um, I had some charters, clamming charters the other day. I've got some pictures of the scallops on the phone if anybody cares to look at them. I mean, they're as big as around as mason jar lids, you know, big. And then not, as you walk around, I don't harvest them with rakes because they're in grass and mud. It's, you know, you're stepping on them and picking them up. And as you walk around, it's just hundreds of undersized, you know. So basically, I'm putting it to you guys to let's see what you can do to give, give us a break on these, you know. I mean, tourists are coming down. They're so limited in the fisheries. One trout or one drum, four trout, one gray trout. You know, I mean, families come down 10, 12, you know, and, and they pay $500 to go out and, and catch these. It's not feeding the whole family. But I can guarantee a trip, and they're going to get two nights worth of clams. Why not subsidize some of those clams with some scallops? Because they are out there. So, I mean, that's my question. What can y'all do to give us a scallop season, a recreational that we can harvest from like the middle of April through the middle of August? Uh, I guarantee is uh, what a, a trip would catch is a lot less than a half a bushel per person per day, I think is in, in y'all's rules. It's a lot less than that. I don't think 50 or 75 scholars would cover the bottom of a bushel basket. Well, maybe, but you know, it's far from the bushel. So that's why I drove down here from Hatters to say, <laughs> you know, on it. I would like to see something get done, you know, with the base scallops in our area. You know, it's a public resource. We've got the uh, residents that live there. Anybody's gone to the grocery store knows how much groceries cost. In the winter, they can go out there and get a meal, you know. I mean, tourists can enjoy a seafood that they probably never had, a local uh, scallop instead of your roasted scallops, which technically are skate wings most of the time. You know, that needs to be addressed. This needs to be addressed. And uh, I appreciate any attention that y'all can give us get going and so we can keep some in the summer. Any questions? Anybody want to see my pictures? <laughs> I, mean, the park I think lot, we all do. <laughs> the lots are cool. I, the graveyard of the Atlantic is a prime one. The Hatter's Ferry Dock, you know, uh, Sandy Bay up there uh, by the Frisco bathhouse in the wintertime. I mean, there's scallop shells all over. If the stock is concerned, you need to get game wards down there to scare the seagulls off from eating them, dropping them on the ground, you know. They sure and they're literally that Anna. thick. Uh, yes, Mike. Uh, yes, Mike. Uh, a quick question for staff. When when do we look at the base gallop FMP? Give me a minute. I'll look. <laughs> I feel like it's over a year away right now. Yeah, I think it's 2020. At least 2020. Oysters and clams come first. Yeah. I, I want to say 25. Yeah. It's, yeah. Either 25 or 26. So if, to answer one of your questions, which is full craft, one thing with base gallops is they're annual. So they only live about 18 months. And so the timing of the season has always been in the winter months. So that way, to April to August, you're not going on to the next cohort that will come in for the next harvest season. So that's partly why there's that constricted season. But in our fishery management plan development that started in 2003, 
two or three amendments at this point. Um, they were depleted at a point that there wasn't any after the red tide event in the late 80s. I understand. And so we we're trying to get them built up. And so it's broken up by areas and your area would be sound. Right. And then there's four sound, back sound and area south of sound. And we have very specific triggers that we do sampling and we sample January, April, July and October. And October is what that window, October to December, defines what we can open for the following winter season, which we can open no sooner than uh, I think the third Monday of January through April 1st. And it has very specific harvest measures, both recreational and commercial, based on how many scallops are found within that sampling. And we do sites that we've been doing for years, like the Sandy Bay one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also do at will from input from fishermen in some areas. So I'd be very happy to know some of those sites that you see those. So we come with me. I mean, come with me. Greg Allen in the Wanchi's office mm -hmm. has a sampling up there because he's more familiar with the regions. Uh, but if we could get exact locations, we could use those that are at will stations for those months. And that will help us better with October. But we did open the season in Core Sound this year. Mm -hmm. um, it hit the trigger at 125% believe of what it was before. And so the season just closed in April. Um, for recreational, it's open, I think, seven days a week, one bushel per person per day. Now it is? Core sound. It Core sound. Okay. So that's partly why that seasonality occurs in the winter months, because we don't want to um, have the harvest to occur when we know that new cohort is coming in. So the less than 50 millimeters or about two inches, mm -hmm. because that might be next year's crop coming in. So, but you're right, there is an increase. Our our um, sampling has shown an increase in all areas, but in some areas we see it more in pockets and not across the region. And we need to see more of that spread across, not so much patching. Do you go down and look behind Portsmouth Island? Um, I'd have to ask Greg the specific. I mean, I've, I've heard fishermen from down there you know, saying the same thing. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. The, the, other, the other thing, uh, to my knowledge, the last time that it was opened up in Dare County, uh, and I'm assuming it would have been Hyde County too, it was 2006. That's 17 years. Yeah, I think it was 2009, but it, I could be wrong. Even still, that, even still, that's 14 years. <laughs> what we with Pamlico is they're not as consistent even through time historically. And um, the little bit of information that has been taken genetically, it, it just depends on how good the spawn is coming in. I understand. And, so and I'll it's, make more, it, it's more broken up and not as consistent as your core sound books and ones. I understand. Yeah. But are y'all taking in consideration the whole masses and schools of these things can swim away in short order? Well, that's why we do the <laughs> every year. Yeah. Yeah knowing that they move and we'll do extra sampling. We did this year because we had heard reports of them moving into certain areas and we did go out, check and look at those sites to evaluate that movement. So throughout that three, four month window. Um, well, like I say, I mean, I've got some pictures of some of them. That, the other day, every year I'll go out and I'll kind of scout out and look for new clam spots because I did not like to go to the area, you know, over and over and over again, like to, and everywhere I've been, uh, you, you know, it's, it's scallops, and I got out the other day, and just you know, as soon as I stepped out of my boat, boom, yeah. it worked. And uh, they've got barnacles on them and grass, so it's like they've stayed there for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a while for barnacle and grass to grow on it. Yeah, if I could get your phone number, that would be great. Yeah. And when I'll give you my card, first, <laughs> I'll uh, have Greg get up yeah. with you to find out some at will sites. Yeah, that would be very helpful. One thing is the sampling is slightly different up there. They do quadrat, so it's shallow water driven. It is. We dredge, mm -hmm. uh, dredge sampling in the other regions. Yeah. Because that's where we're. Everything I do is in ankle to Good. waist deep water at the most. And with that sample. I'd like to offer my area too, because I see B6, B7, we've got a lot of scallops coming through, especially in March and April. I'm happy to offer my boat as well. Yeah. yeah well, just your number so we can get locations. No problem. I think I have it. So. I think so. <laughs> yeah, but I. So, so a long, a, a short answer to, the, to my charters, you know, I mean, what can I tell them? You, you know, I mean, I'm telling them, you know, just 
Well, well, right now it's right now. I, I guess I'm just saying there's no season. They don't have the information. Right. On. There isn't, and if we could open the season, shame. it has to meet the triggers, and then it would be in January through April, late January through April, if your area opened. Well, why couldn't it be in the summertime? Currently, because of that cohort issue, if we could be stepping on next year's crop going out there at that time, and there is that quite overlap. Are you for sure on that? Yeah, you look at the, we just went sampling last week and there's some out there that are uh, less than 20 millimeters, so less than an inch and some great as great as 50, so two inches. And so that would be what's growing in for this year. And then their reproduction window peaks in October, but there are some peaks in the spring as well. So there could be some spawning activity going on in certain areas of the state, depending on timing and location, temperature and that. Too. So that's that's the other thing is it's really you've got to be careful with something that doesn't move a whole lot, but only has about an 18 month lifespan. Too. They can grow from something like the thumbnail to four inches in 18 months. Mm -hmm. That's pretty quick. Yeah, actually, in about two months, two inches. Hmm. You can do quite a bit of growth. So, yeah, and January, they're so small, they're on the grasses and you can see them like yeah. less than 10 millimeters. So like a quarter, less than a quarter of an inch. Yeah. And they'll be just out there on the grass, like little specks, little pimples. Well, <clears throat> do what you can. I mean, I greatly appreciate it. It's just, just myself and one other company that really does uh, the clamming aspect. I mean, all the charter boats, well, I don't say all of them, but some of them will, yeah. but they don't like to do it. Me, it's a guaranteed so, thing, put the food on the yeah. So what will really help <laughs> if we reopen the plan in 2025 is come to scoping. Give your ideas of where you see things and also start taking down some of your numbers like locations of where you see the scallops on high county you mentioned i'm not aware too much on that side they tend to be more in the grass bed areas yeah well it's shallow the whole all, the whole back side of oak cook island is like that yeah are you harvesting mussels at all uh I, i've not tried but i've seen the indicators you're talking the little mounds but, yeah they're good yeah they're you need a good you need something i don't know what you, you get a hori hori knife it's like a gardening knife and you you can push under the side of the muscle like the muscle because they grow up like blue and onions right and you push it down on the side and you can push them up and damn it's good eating they're it's there. Filled, salty. like a razor clam mm -hmm. muddy oh you got a problem you with mud if you're in there and place <laughs> Places no, down there, off and the places down here, so are good. High. It's like miniature castles everywhere. You, you should give them a try. They are fantastic. They Obviously, you can't eat them raw, but you have to you get one of those tools there, and like just online or at uh, like uh, Ace Hardware, just at like a Hori Hori H O R I H O R I. Probably on Amazon. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it definitely they're cheap too. They're like seven bucks, and um, so they can they can feed a big family. It's like the rib muscles. Yes. Really dark red meat. Uh, no, they their meat changes just like the eye muscles do. Yeah, the like orange edges. or yellow or white. Um, their edges move around or not flat, which the blue muscle has the flatter. Yes, and the uh, our muscles grow between two to six inches. And yeah. now I eat the six inch ones, but your people might want to start off with something more familiar, like the Prince Edward Island size. Yeah, they, they they're ask They're amazing. About, All you need is butter and garlic and a little salad. About, You're set. You can grill them. Oh my God. I'm hungry, y'all. Get that knife from Keller's. Yeah. yeah. Close. Yeah. They're delicious. And you just have to look up your proclamations oh, and your set. And it's, it's fun and it's it's so quickly rewarding that it would be yeah. a great charter like yeah uh, that's that's a good talk uh, Give it but, a go. but at any rate it'd be great to have some scallops in the summertime but if not at least give us a harvest in the winter time i mean you know i'll your phone number okay january through april right you said yeah it's uh right now in the plan it's the like the last monday in january through march 31st that is the window that we can open awesome but that could be changing the plan, which has a slightly different time period in the rule, but don't ask me off the top of my head. But it's still within that window, pretty close. But maybe through May. Yeah. The other thing is, you know, we talk about FMPs and we're starting on the FMP. And one of the things we hear from people a lot of times is, well, we're, we're starting the FMP and they say, well, what about this year's data? And so 
you know, we're always following our data, following our data. So we're years out from that plan. Now is the time to collect that data. So this is a perfect time to reach out to Greg Allen, was it? And talk to him and start to make sure that we're capturing what's out there that you're seeing. Now is that time. So this is the perfect time to jump on that because then when 2025, that's when we're gonna be looking at the data that we're collecting and that's this year's data and next year's data. So we could have three four moments cohorts of data by the time we open that plan, which is pretty good for something that only lives 18 months. Yeah. I'm going to put in a pitch here. Our <laughs> annual FMP review. Oh, yes. <laughs> the data that Tina's talking about, the trigger analysis, is in our annual update that comes out in July each year, and we present it to the MFP every August meeting. Um, so you can see annually what where we fall in that trigger analysis. Um, so get with Tina and she'll give you that information. Yep. So, all right, well, I got three cars. Anybody wants one number? Okay. okay, I got some more out in the truck. Yep. <laughs> no. Perfect, I'll pass them all on down. Kelly, thank you so much. Anybody wants one? And go on there, my number's on there, our website's there, you can see what we do. Thank you so much. You Glad you're here. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Yeah. All right, next we got Glenn Skinner. Really just got a couple of questions for the presentation. I was listening to the presentation. I wasn't able to see the If I understood you right, you said there was no appetite for catching on these fish for say that was quite accurate. I, I, Probably didn't hear a whole lot, but I did mention at the meeting that you had something to control those discards and the overall catch in the water. Required, uh, you, you know, collecting areas of suspicion, and you have to do it. That's the problem in that spec for trout fishery, harvest of course. So many fish are caught, discard. So I just want to make sure that you. Uh, probably not a real wide range in the recreational sector, but at some point you can't continue to harvest over and over again. It's not solving the issue you have and start dealing with that waste and the dead discard issue. It seems to be the major issue. Seems to be the major issue in several other fish. Just want to make that point. You did hear um Similar comment as the northern issue. So that's what Jason was updating with a lot of like that yeah. everything kind of world. And so sure. the, the northern ACs. I'm not sure overwhelmingly there was support for it, but it was a little bit. And um, yeah, you know, I just think we need to start thinking outside of that box. And uh, harvest reduction can't continue to go into place over and over again without addressing the other uses and the other sources of mortality. health. Uh, have any harvest and be totally at this point. Trying to get a green control run for their money. That's empty. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, thank you for your comments. All right, we are on to uh, any issues from other AC members at all? Mike, Doug? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, Laura, anything else? Nope. That's it for right. us. Um, in terms of the, oh, did you have something? I just wanted, um, there's uh, going to be an oyster summit May 9th and 10th up in Raleigh. If anybody's interested, it's going to be an update on the oyster blueprint and there'll be a legislative reception. We're thanking the legislators for their support for oyster efforts in North Carolina. Also ask them to continue to support um, work. What was the date? What was the date again? The 9th and 10th up in Raleigh. Um, it's the web, if you go to our, the ncoast.org website um, for the Coastal Federation, there's a it's right there on the front page. It's a link to everything, uh, but it's lots of people putting it on. We're just hosting the event information. That's going to be a great event. I just wish it was during wild oyster season, man. Thank you. 
All right. Um, I will mention, uh, so the division is celebrating um, its 200th year. And um, this summer, we are going to be holding a um, jamboree where we're going to have all of the division's programs and um, people out to just be available and have a fun time talking about what we do and why we do it and you know, trucks. food trucks. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. We're going to be on the water with food trucks in the summer. So <laughs> hopefully we'll have some people come by. Heck yeah. Yeah. So we'll have more information and we'll, we'll be sending that out. And just if, if it's okay, I'll just give an update on the jam, the, excuse me, the um, July joint thing. We had talked about that before. We've had some people join since then. So I want to make sure that you heard that um, the date was set for that. It's July 10th. It's going to be a full day, um, July 10th, which is a Monday, and it's going to be held at the Pineville Shores Aquarium. Um, we are um, we are working with them, um, and they are uh, basically we're able to use their space for a reduced fee, and so because of that, we're going to be able to provide travel for folks because we know it's going to be a lot of travel. Um, we did make an effort to find something that was more centrally located and just able to do that. So Final Shores Aquarium, July 10th, and you will see emails from us um, as those plans begin to solidify. Thank you. So let me do that again. Thank you. All right. I guess that uh, everyone's comfortable. We'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you, guys. Nice job. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. I apologize for not being there. Uh, Happy anniversary. Happy oh, yeah, anniversary, Paul. Number, number one, my, my liaison didn't call me and remind me, but it wouldn't have made no difference. I had to do what I had to do. So it's like everywhere happy else. Happy life, happy life. If mommy ain't happy, <laughs> nobody ain't happy. So anyway, I'm sorry I was late. Have a good night, Doug. See y'all later. Yeah. I'm just not going to be here tomorrow. I'm leaving here tomorrow. Maybe. He should be here tomorrow, though. I don't call him. No, he did. Yeah. Did I hear meeting tomorrow? What meeting tomorrow? Tomorrow. It wasn't you. What meeting tomorrow? Not me. Yeah.